Hi everyone, I'm Emma Eggleston, Dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Division. Tonight's Mini Med School is an update on COVID-19 and the influenza. And it is presented for us by our very own Dr. Matt Simmons. So Dr. Simmons is an infectious disease physician, an expert in everything COVID and flu related. Matt has also been a guiding voice for our health system in responding to COVID-19 as well as a guiding voice for the community and the state. And we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you, Matt, and take it away. Hi, I'm Matt Simmons. You probably remember me from such COVID presentations as the two I've done before, but guess what? It's about that time again, and we're gonna get started with the most recent updates. I'd like him to make a disclaimer. You see that I'm not wearing a mask. That's because there's nobody close to me for more than probably even 12 to 14 feet, let alone six feet, which is why it's okay for me to present to you without a mask on. We're gonna talk a little bit about masks and the importance of masks later in the presentation, but for right now, let's just kind of jump in because I know what you really want, which is the numbers. So an outline, we will talk about United States cases first and then West Virginia cases, some new treatment guidelines because everybody's interested in that vaccine updates, the importance of masks, and then we'll talk a little bit about flu season and COVID, okay? So what you're looking at is from the beginning of the pandemic until now, this is a flow of the number of changes of new cases that are seen in the, the United States. Why that's important to you is as you can see, there's a trend. And when we follow pandemics, we look to see how many cases are being diagnosed every day and the total number of cases that we're seeing overall. This is obviously not a total number of cases, but number of new cases that are being seen across the United States. Why that's important is you see this huge jump that occurred in late June and early July, and this gently down uh, trending slope. That's great for us because this number of cases shows that we're pushing out um, the overall number of new cases that are being diagnosed on a daily basis. And we wouldn't wanna see this number go higher and higher and so some of the social distancing we've done has worked really well and we, that's why we need to continue to focus on abatement uh, processes to keep those number of cases down. So over 6 million cases and if you see in the United States alone 6,825,313 cases with the number that were reported yesterday about 36,000 new cases. In the last 14 days, the trend you can see is taking kind of what we call a sine wave up and down kind of process. And you can see it's on a slight bit of decline. Now, deaths in the United States are 199,633. That's a huge number of deaths, but it's much more than we thought it could have been at this time, though we're anticipating that number to continue to grow as time goes on. The, the number of cases from yesterday, 921, that uh, were reported were 213 deaths in the United States alone. Now, this is the other graph that we were talking about. This is cases over time, and this is the total number of cases at any one point that we're seeing in the United States. And you can see these number of cases as they're increasing up and down. Um, you see that same kind of trend. Now. The numbers as they break down for the world, um, 31 million, the United States 6.8 million, West Virginia 14,171, and Berkeley County 947. We'll look at Jefferson here in a minute as well. If you look, the number of cases um, on in the world in worldwide are slowly trending up. It's a low curve, but it's slowly trending up, and. Cases in the United States were dropping for the last 20 to 30 days, but you see, start to see a little bit increase again. West Virginia, you see a, a marked off take where it's going up. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it's probably a couple of things. One is the opening of universities and other schools. You see a number of cases when you put a large number of people together and these people have some of these spikes you see are when the university opened, the West Virginia University opened. And you can see that Berkeley County took off as well with an increased number of cases over the last couple of weeks. Now, if you see specifically for Berkeley County, 947 cases with recovered of 367, that doesn't mean that 
more people haven't gotten better. It means that the clinical definition of recovery has been met by these people and they've been released by the health department. There's many more people that are probably getting better, but it's just that they haven't met these requirements yet. And you can see in Berkeley County, 13 deaths, and that's total. So as you can see, the cases in Berkeley County have gone up and down. You can see some reflection in cases increasing during holiday times. Um, you see some cases increasing when uh, restri social restrictions kind of came back and people were allowed to travel a little bit more. And then this huge spike here. If you look, this is probably the post uh, Labor Day spike when people are out doing a lot of things, spending a lot of time together, but cookouts and things like that. But what you see is this kind of up and down trend. And this is related to the fact that it there's an incubation period from the time that you're exposed until the time that your case is diagnosed by symptoms or testing. You can see Jefferson County. Jefferson County has the same kind of spikes and valleys, but the numbers are mu much smaller. And that's probably related to the geographical distribution of patients in Jefferson County, as well as the total difference in population. So trends for West Virginia, the blue line that you see is cases and the uh, so percent of positive people and the purple line you see is mortality. And you can see the mortality in West Virginia is hanging right around 2.21%, 2.23% and the number, total number of cases is somewhere around 2.5% of the population. Why is that important to you? Well. These are smaller numbers, and if you think back to the original lecture that we had when we were talking about a mortality rate of 4%, and now looking at a mortality rate of about 2%, as the numbers kind of wash out and settle, this is a huge difference. Even though it's 2%, it's dozens and dozens, hundreds of people that are not dying. And this is a much better mortality prediction than we were hoping for, where early in Italy, the, the mortality rate was up as high as 12%, and in other places in the United States. We see a definite variance in the number of mortality, the percentage of mortality, depending on where you are in the world, where you are in the country, in the world where you are, your socioeconomic class, gender, race, age, medical comorbidities. So this is all normed out to kind of include all these things. And why that's important to you is that this is a brief snapshot of, of all comers who have COVID, the mortality rate of those cases. So this doesn't necessarily predict your risk of mortality if you're a 75 year old with COPD and diabetes and hypertension. This also includes the 19 year olds, the 25 year olds, the 40 year olds with di well controlled diabetes. But this is an overall mortality estimate and an overall per percentage of the population that's positive. Why that's important as you can see this is a slow continued increase. Um, which is anticipated as you see more people being infected, but it hasn't sort of taken off. Now, if you look at case fatality across the world, and that's what I was just talking about, you can see that there's definitely a variance based upon where you are in the world. And you can see that the darker colors have a higher mortality rate, up to 25%, and then, of course, the lighter colors are less mortality. You can see that representative of the United States in the data that I just showed you, somewhere between 1% and 3%, around 2.5% is where um, the United States sits. Canada, slightly higher, and Mexico, significantly higher, as well as other places in the world you see th which have a higher mortality rate, and then of course those which are lower. Now, you can look at this and say, well, it looks to me, Matt, like certain countries in Africa are doing much better, but it's probably the fact that these, these numbers are all skewed by reporting, and you've heard our president say that you know, if we do less testing, there'll be less cases. And everyone kind of laughs and says, well, of course, if you don't look for it, you're not gonna find it. But it affects both sides of that equation. So when you're looking in, at a statement like, when there's less testing, you'll see less cases, that also influences the mortality rates because if you have less defined cases of the milder disease, then it looks like the higher percentage of people who are positive are dying. And if you look, the United States has a lot more resources in testing than a lot of other places, and we continue to test even asymptomatic people where other countries um, 
testing strategies to look at more defined clinical illness in severely ill people. And so their mortality rates might be higher. One of those confounders is Italy, and they're still kind of working out the numbers, but Italy has a higher average age, medical comorbidities. And so their numbers are higher probably because as they're testing, they were testing a lot more people who are at risk. You can see that India has lower, you know, Russia. There are places, and of course there's patient where there's, you know, no recorded deaths. Obviously that's probably not the case, but these are probably just where we're not getting enough data. And you can see that there's, you know, certain countries that share land mass where the numbers are different depending on where you are in the country. And those are artificial. So take all this fatality data with a grain of salt, okay? What I want you to remember is, is that probably in order to get a truly accurate estimate of mortality associated with COVID-19, you'd have to test everybody, even asymptomatic people, and you'd have to look at those whose death was truly attributable only to COVID-19 and not other things. There are some people who are diagnosed with COVID who die from other things, but their mortality includes death associated to COVID because of some of the reporting laws that we have. And so these, all these numbers are probably skewed one way or the other. So if you look at mortality trends in the United States over time, you see that there's a sudden drop off and then it increases up to 6% and then kind of normalizes out. And that's exactly what we were talking about. We're talking about initially there was a very low, uh, you had a big drop in mortality, which was probably associated to an increase in testing. So as you see this mortality rate take off approaching 6%, this is probably because at the time when we were looking at testing, if you look at it, it's in late April, early May, that's when testing was widely becoming available. So then all of a sudden you had a bunch of people dying who tested positive. And then the mortality rate drops off likely as these numbers were being reported backwards looking at, you know, these deaths probably were attributable to this, you have a number. And then more and more people who were diagnosed survived. And so here you have a vulnerable population, there's not much testing, the people that you're testing are dying because they have a really high risk of mortality associated with it. And then these numbers kind of norm out as you test more and more people and you see that younger people, people who are less sensitive to the virus, are getting the virus and surviving. And so you see this mortality rate kind of drop. And you'll see this kind of varies from the mortality rate that we saw associated with West Virginia. and that number, like I said, between two and three, one percent is a really difficult number to ascertain as far as change in mortality. So these numbers are probably somewhere in this range. But what you're seeing is as the numbers increase, as we have continued reported cases of mild disease that people recover, this mortality is being corrected. So you will see this continually probably drop to around 2% and that's where we think the actual mortality is. Why that's important is remember seasonal influenza mortality rate with appropriate vaccination probably is 0.1% or less. So that's still astronomically a lot more than influenza. And so that this, this kind of data here just kind of does away with the idea that the flu and COVID, that COVID is no more dangerous than the flu. So I think that we just put that to rest. The numbers don't lie. You can't make the numbers lie. So we'll just go with that assumption. This is the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources from the Bureau of Public Health daily dashboard. And this is accessible to anybody. If you get on to the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources, these numbers are available for you on the dashboard. And you can see there's a lot of stuff. County alert system, seven day trend, cumulative summary. And we'll go through some of that stuff. But what is really good is the West, state of West Virginia believes in transparency. These numbers might be a day or two behind. So, you know, don't, panic if you hear something on one news outlet and this is no one's lying it's just the reporting is a little bit low you can see that there are over 14,000 cases 312 deaths 117 new cases in the last 24 hours and this was actually taken from a day ago current number of active cases 3,544 but remember those are not just people who are actively sick these are people who have not been cleared by the health department there is a defined set and how you get um, released. This is the number of confirmed laboratory tests. So we've tested over a half a million people in West Virginia. Um, cumulative percentage is 2.73% of people who were um, 
total number of cases that are tested. So that means of all the people who are tested, this is how many were positive, and this is the daily percent of positive. So of the number of daily cases confirmed. So the cumulative is 2.7, but the overall daily percent is about 2% of people who are getting tested are positive. This is another one, this is a hospital trend, and this is something that uh, everybody is kind of probably interested in, but it's a little bit harder data to find. You can see that as of 920, there were 162 people across the state that were hospitalized, um, and that number has slowly just kind of increased. As you see, the, the trend is an upward going trend, that trend line that you see, and of course it's kind of gone slowly up and up, but if you look at the statewide number of cases of ICU, uh, people that are sick enough to be in the ICU, those numbers have also trended up, but at a less kind of a steep rate. And it's kind of bouncing around in the high 50s, low 60s. And the, everybody that's in the ICU is not the, you know, on event, maxed out, dying. But there are people that require a higher level of care. And there is about 20% of people who are hospitalized who end up be needing to be in the ICU. And of course, you know, the number of patients on the vent, and that's these two things. This is a confirmatory of this. You can see that this number is much less. So out of that 58, only 28 of them were on the vent, which is reassuring. You can see there were a couple of spikes here. There was a really scary spike here in early September, but those numbers have decreased. So really, a lot of people in the hospital relatively, um, 162 across the state, only about a half to a third of those at any one time are in the ICU, probably, and of those, about, you know, 28 of that 162 are in critical condition th that require a vent. These numbers are important and they continue to trend true. And as we see an increase in number of cases, this, these trends will probably continue. So we wanna actually make sure that we continue to flatten and press on the curve to keep it from continuing. It's not hard though to see how very quickly these numbers ballooning drag these two numbers up with them and you could outstrip your capabilities of providing critical care to patients, which is why we continue to press for masking and social distancing and hand washing. This is another really good, um, this is a percentage um, comparison between the state of West Virginia and the rest of the country. And you can see case fatality rate. Certain states have a much higher case fatality rate. Um, Pennsylvania, which a higher population density. West Virginia is around 2.2. You can see that we're actually performing pretty well compared to the rest and better than the United States average. That 2.8%, that 3% uh, mortality rate is, like I said, it's somewhere between two and three. That's holding true. You can see the percentage of the, the state population is about 0.79. So we talk about 2% of the cases being tested are positive, but the overall percentage of the state of West Virginia is much lower than everybody else. And that's probably due to a couple of things. One is West Virginians were doing a very good job of social distancing and masking early on in the pandemic and also to our geographical distribution and population density of patients and people compared to states like Virginia and Maryland where the percentages are much higher. Um, and then of course the United States overall. The population percentage testing, you can see that West Virginia continually tends to outperform everybody in testing. And that's because <coughs> West Virginia University Hospital Systems was very aggressive early on in acquiring several testing platforms and getting people tested, offering you know outpatient testing through our tent system across the state of West Virginia. And our partners and Marshall and CMC also attempting to do those kind of things, showing that the healthcare community in West Virginia is really pushing to get testing out there. And you can see as the United States overall is doing really well with testing. But then again, if you look at the case fatality rate in Pennsylvania being 5.3 and their percent of the population being less, there's again that skewing of numbers, less number of people being tested, more mortality probably associated with some of the milder cases not being diagnosed. And the percentage positive, you can see that West Virginians are much better off in any situation than those people being tested. Why? Because we're doing two things. One, we're testing a lot of people, so we're testing a lot of people with low pre-probability 
low test probability of being positive. And then also too, we're doing a lot to intervene and get people tested for nursing homes, school placements. And so when you're testing a lot of people who are unlikely to have the virus, then those number of tests decrease as other states have to focus on more dense populations and testing those people who are high at risk. So these numbers, while they look great, again, make sure you understand that this just doesn't mean that West Virginia is dominating the testing arena. We are doing a very good job, but also there's some factors in our testing uh, procedure and our just the nature of our state itself that probably skews these numbers. So now we're going to get to the stuff that everyone's really interested in, the good juicy stuff, which is treatment guideline updates. So since early February, you've heard a ton of things about how to treat COVID. And the truth is, is that you've heard hydroxychloroquine and steroids and plasma and, you know, autoimmune drugs and immune modulators and antibiotics. And the truth of it is, is that we have never attempted to treat a virus with all these kind of supplemental therapies as much as we have with COVID. Historically, our approach to viruses, all except a few, are to let them run their course. And but in the attempt to reduce the amount of lives lost to COVID, we've done a lot of you know, rapid cycle change and how we treat viruses and what we're looking at. And so let's talk about some of the bigger things that have been like on everybody's lips recently. Convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma, in short, is somebody gets sick with COVID, they get better, their body produces antibodies that help them protect them from COVID, and we harvest that from their blood and give it to somebody else who is actively sick with COVID in an attempt to reproduce the immune response. As you can see, these are all updated within the last month. This says there's insufficient data either for or against convalescent plasma. What that says to physicians is you can try it if someone's really sick. We're not gonna tell you that it's harmful, but don't necessarily expect some kind of well-balanced response that's gonna help somebody. And they say there's been these kind of trials are needed to determine perspective, which means looking forward to see if it's gonna happen, well-controlled, adequately powered, randomized trials, which is a bunch of doctor talk and scientist talk to basically say like, we need to make sure that the people are getting better due to this intervention and not just from something else as a reason that they're getting better. It's difficult to uh, achieve this because it requires a lot of plasma to produce that kind of antibody. There's not that many people that had a robust immune response to it. It's a human product, so someone has to volunteer to sit and have their blood spun off. And there's no guarantee that it works because everyone's immune system sl works slightly different. There's a bunch of different mechanisms by which the immune system functions. So there's no guarantee. We've used it at WVU Hospital. We were even were part of a uh, research program to do it. It worked for some patients, it didn't work for others. Uh, it's not the silver bullet, but we, we still keep it in our armamentarium. So this is really important and it's chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. And why I'm gonna make a big deal about this is that these are medicines that are provided by prescription that any provider can write. And why that's important is because very early on, some very key people in our healthcare and governmental structure were big proponents of this. We're not gonna talk about whether or not those people were right or wrong, we're just gonna talk about the science, and the science does not recognize any added benefit and may recognize some harm. So the panel that made the decisions for treatment guidelines recommends against the use of it because the mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine is an involved kind of, it doesn't necessarily fight the virus, it primes certain cells in the body to be less receptive to the virus, and it didn't really kind of pan out. And so we don't recommend the use of it. And why that's important is because still today, there are people being prescribed it because healthcare providers are really bad about it. If they think that something works, if they hear it, the first thing that they hear, and it could be benefit, they kind of stick with it. And you really got to look at the science and stay current with the science and understand that this does not benefit patients as far as we can tell. Now you'll say to me, Matt, I've heard clinical trials. There've been people that says this person, that I read an article, the president says this, this doctor says this. 
And that is absolutely correct. There are dozens to even hundreds of studies out there looking at hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. But when you do a meta-analysis, which is you take all those cases and you kind of lump them together and add up the data and do some complex statistical math, it shows that there's really probably not a benefit and actually probably a harm. Because remember, these medicines have a lot of cardiac side effects that a lot of people who are high risk for um, COVID have those cardiac problems. So we don't want to just test these people with these medications if we don't need to, okay? They're, they also have some side effects, blindness and other things. So it's not something you want to take lightly. This is not like, oh, I'm just going to take an over-the-counter vitamin because even those can be dangerous if they're used incorrectly. But these medications definitely have very what we call narrow therapeutic windows, which means there's a certain dose that works in a certain population of people. So there's no evidence currently. That doesn't mean that someone will come out with a study in a couple of months, a couple of weeks, but right now, based on what we have, if you are sick with COVID and someone tries to give you these medicines, ask them why they're doing it. Okay? Ivermectin. Another big thing, this is an anti-parasitic drug that's being used um, in other countries with some questionable response. There is no evidence um, to support its use. This again is a narrow therapeutic window. It has a lot of interactions with other drugs that people are on a lot of medications. The average person in the United States is on at least two medications. We don't recommend the use of this medication. And why, why is this all important? It's because we want to do something to help. If there's something we can do, you know, you've heard about elderberry, you've heard about vitamin D, you've heard about aspirin. Again, there's not a lot of clinical data out there to support any of these things. So, you know, if you're going to do something that you think is to help you or to treat you if you have COVID, talk to your healthcare provider before you do it on your own and make sure that they do their research. So we're going to talk about vaccines next and level of testing. And it's really important because there are hundreds of vaccine candidates out there, but they're not all at the same place because vaccine research occurs in stages. And the preclinical state, and it goes from preclinical to phase three. And so preclinical is you give the vaccine to animals to see if it triggers an immune response. So this is just does it work at all. And whether or not you're pro or anti-animal research, this is historically how this has been done. This is not an ethical kind of question, a moral question for me to address right now. This is just how this preclinical happens. Phase one is that the vaccine is given to a small group of healthy people to see if it is safe and learn if it actually works in humans. So if it works in animals, mice, rabbits, chimpanzees, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll work in humans. So in this first phase of clinical testing, you test a group of healthy humans, a very small number, to see if it causes catastrophic changes, if it causes you know, an immune response. So this is like the pioneer kind of like, these are brave young college students, most likely between the ages of 18 and 25, who volunteer with no medical problems to go and get this. If this works, after a period of weeks to months, then you get to a phase two where it's given to hundreds of people so they can learn about its safety and the correct dosage. Because as you kind of get more people, you see number one, if it's safe for more people who don't necessarily fit that perfect candidate for a vaccine. And also to kind of figure out, do we have to give a lot of this vaccine? Do we give a little bit? Does it have to come in one dose? Does it have to come in several doses? And so we think that it's safe at phase two, we're just not sure how effective it is and how much we need to give to be effective. And then in phase three trials, these are big trials, thousands of people that are given to confirm its safety, including rare side effects. And you've probably heard of the AstraZeneca um, vaccine that was put on a temporary hold because they felt that a patient developed a very serious side effect, it was later determined not to be related to the vaccine and then you see if it's effective. And these trials involve control in which, so everything before people are just getting, people or animal are getting the vaccine. Some people here are given placebo, and so it's just normal saline or something else that doesn't have an effect, so that we can see that, is it something that we're doing that's specific to the vaccine, to the vaccine regimen that's causing these people to have an immune response? It's not just the fact that something happens, you know, you make people aware of it. So phase three trial is the last step before we go into widespread distribution. And then there's another phase, sometimes referred to as phase four, which is post-marketing, which means your healthcare provider monitors all of their patients to see if anybody has a side effect. 
So these steps usually can take years to even a decade, but project warp speed, warp drive, depending on what you want to call it, this has condensed this down into less than a year. So you say, well, Matt, is that safe? And the truth of it is, is that if you're looking as far as safety, safety is actually pretty easy to determine. Remember, all these people that were in the phase one clinical trial, they're months out from it now, so we don't see any side effects. Even probably the people from phase two, the phase three efficacy trials, so the real risk you run from getting a, a vaccine that's developed very quickly is not that it won't be safe because safety is the first priority. You don't wanna give somebody a vaccine that makes things worse. And we've done that in the past in an attempt to help people. We've pushed vaccines through, but it was much earlier in the vaccine development science and we learned from our mistakes and haven't done that since. This is what you have to worry about is, will this be effective for people? Will everybody that gets it, including the people that don't have a robust immune system, will they develop protection from the virus from it? And so, if you're worried about a vaccine being dangerous, don't worry about that. Worry about getting a vaccine that may not be effective. Now, the newer vaccines that are directed towards COVID are mRNA vaccines, and it's beyond the scope of this presentation to kind of teach you about those kind of vaccines and what they mean. But it's a different type of vaccine that's much more likely to produce an immune response. Also remember, the mRNA vaccines that are the front runners for this virus are actually been years in research because they came out into existence in an attempt to create a vaccine for MERS and SARS, which disappeared. So there's years of backbone research on the safety and efficacy of mRNA vaccines. You just don't know a lot about it because MERS and SARS went away and we didn't need a wide scale vaccination policy, fortunately, because both MERS and SARS were much scarier viruses. So here's your front runners for your candidate vaccines. And you can see I've only included the phase three because really there's the only ones that right now that are any kind of hope for a vaccine within the next six months. So the ones that you're seeing, we'll just look at, there's one coming from Wuhan, China, actually two. Those are probably not front runners for us. This is an adenovirus recombinant vaccine. You take two different viruses and kind of push them together, take genetic pieces from one or the other, um, so that the body produces antibodies against the vaccine that you want to protect from, but it's harvested from a much more benign virus that the body actually knows how to. Probably not going to be our front runners in the United States. If you look, there's the AstraZeneca one that we talked about that was a replication deficient viral vector, um, vector vaccine, which means, it's, again, it's kind of a chimera vaccine. This is the one that we're concerned about may have caused some uh, side effects in humans. It's been determined that is not the case, but again, not one of our front runners. The, this one is the one you need to keep your eyes on. Kaiser Permanente is the institution, Washington Health Research Center, by Moderna vaccines. It's an mRNA-based vaccine, and it has a, a, a piece of genetic structure of the virus. This is the one that's in late phase three trials. Moderna has promised that they can probably produce significant numbers of vaccines up into the 100 million level but by late January. So keep your eye on this. This is probably, you're gonna to continue to hear a lot about it. Moderna is um, a pretty progressive uh, company. So you'll continue to see that. And then of course, then there's the CoronaVac, which is a Sinovac research program. It's an inactivated vaccine. It's in there, but probably not going to be your front runner. There's another one from Pfizer, um, which, is Pfizer has some capabilities that they have uh, joined with a German company to produce hundreds of uh, millions of vaccine, up to a billion a year that will probably be ready early part of the year. So you may see more than one vaccine candidate vaccine enter the market at one place. Um, and these are just different things that you'll see becoming available. Um, the vaccine, what we do know about the vaccine now is that it will probably be a multi-step vaccine and it will probably be distributed by the government, state and healthcare facilities instead of like Walmart, Walgreens and things like that due to some regulations of early vaccine release. That's nothing to worry about. That's completely normal. It's not a conspiracy thing. So just don't be panicked when you hear that the government is going to release the vaccine because it's actually the government that's invested billions of dollars into vaccine development, not private companies. So don't worry about that. So let's talk about vaccine is the vaccine is the silver bullet. 
Vaccination is the single largest intervention besides hand washing that has saved lives over the history. Now, if you're an anti-vaxxer and you wanna bash me in the comments, that's great, don't worry about it. We can agree to disagree. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I'm a true proponent of vaccination. I encourage people to do it. The analogy is you could drive over a bridge, that bridge could be 99.7% safe. There's always a 0.3% chance that something will happen, but you have to kind of play your odds. And everything in medicine is a risk benefit analysis. And I would tell you, if you're in that high risk, especially getting the vaccine is much safer than risking COVID. So let's talk about basic protection though. Until the vaccine becomes a reality, what can you do? So what protects against it? Physical distancing, you can see that if you're less than one meter, which is three feet, the, the, the likelihood that someone's transmitting it to you is about 12.8%. If you are away more than a, a meter, it's 2.6. And if you're at six feet or two meters, it's much less. Face masks, there's, so you'll hear people argue that face masks don't work. It's a complicated science to get to get into and you're like sort of how's it complicated about it? You either wear a mask or you don't. But there's all kind of combinations which we'll talk about in a second. But there's definitely evidence that people wearing masks reduces transmission. Now it's much more important that if you're sick that you're wearing a mask and it's correct. A mask is much more likely, a homemade mask is much more likely to protect you if the person who is sick is wearing it then then you're wearing it to protect yourself which is why we really want to push for everyone to wear masks but even something is better than nothing and we'll talk about that and then eye protection there's a there was an article out this week that talks about are glasses sufficient or do you need a face shield glasses probably work better than nothing but they're not superior to a face shield i'm not encouraging you necessarily to wear a face shield unless you're in healthcare and then you're much closer to people in a prolonged period of time. I don't think you need to necessarily wear a face shield if you're out at your grocery store or local store, but it does add some protection. Why this is important is you can see on the, in this graphic, the people in red are the people who are sick and the people in blue are the people who are healthy. If neither one is wearing a mask and they're less than six feet apart, there's a very high chance of transmission. If only the healthy person is wearing a mask, it's high, but not very high. So there is some benefit and we, it's hard to kind of say exactly how much benefit people want specific numbers. It's really hard. It is much, you're very, very much more protected, but it's still a high risk. If the person who is sick is wearing it and they're less than six feet, it's medium. If they're both wearing a mask and they're less than six feet apart, it's very low. If they're both wearing a mask and they're at least six feet apart, it's very low. And of course, if the person who is sick stays home, there's almost no chance. We're really striving to get this level of protection, okay? Really what you're probably seeing now is at the beginning of the pandemic, we're seeing this, which is why it kind of took off. And now you're seeing probably this as people continue to wear their mask, which is a low risk uh, to this with social distancing. This is why social distancing is so important. This physical distancing plus mask really reduces your transmission rate significantly. So we are striving for this, which is to flatten the curve and possibly completely reduce transmission among high risk people. This is what we're striving for. This is why everyone needs to wear a mask. And this is why we need to really be important with physical distancing because this versus this or this, it's just astronomical, the change that it makes. Okay. Now here's a really interesting thing. Uh, scientists did some research on showing the effectiveness of masks, and this is, this would be if someone who is sick is wearing a mask, you can see they sneeze without a mask on and with a mask on, just the difference of, you know, wearing this mask, not wearing the mask. This is the amount of bacteria that's being spread. And we use bacteria as a stand-in for virus because these are droplets. And so you can definitely see there's still transmission but if you wear a mask, it's much less. And why it's really important is look at this cough. Cough is the main mechanism of transmission. Sneezing occurs much less with COVID than we initially thought. But you can see with a mask, just, just almost no transmission. And then you can see here how the distance is important, a mask and no mask. Really at six feet, this is important. Even if you're wearing a mask, you know, if you're not wearing a mask at six feet, 
it's really helpful. But wearing a mask at six feet, it's just very little to no transmission. But you can see the further you get away, the less transmission you have, and then just how masking helps. This is, it's hard to argue with this. This is just, if you want proof, if you want to see it, there's the proof. That is proof that masking and distancing work. You just gotta, again, you can't argue with that. So let's talk about flu versus COVID because that's really what's about to happen. We are approaching flu season and you know, flu season varies in severity from year to year based upon a bunch of different things. The weather, how much, you know, how many people get the vaccine, how virulent the strain is. And it's really hard, you can see, to tell these things apart. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, you know, the flu and coronavirus can very much look like one another. Allergies can too, but like I said, sneezing is really more allergies than COVID, the itchy eyes, runny nose, just feeling like someone hits you in the face with a wet mop kind of feeling, that's allergies. Um, systemically, you can feel bad from allergies, but really you gotta worry about these kind of overlap. Why that's important is, imagine right now, 100 people are in the ER. And if there's 100 people in the ER and three of them have a respiratory-like illness, we can isolate those people. We can test them. We can really kind of control where they're going and who they're exposing to. If in four weeks, flu outbreak occurs, and then that number quadruples, quintuples, you know, times 10, and all of a sudden there are 25 people with a flu-like illness that could be COVID or could be the flu, it becomes very much more difficult to kind of funnel these people into safe distancing and testing and things like that. It is super, super important that we do everything to prevent the flu, just like we do the coronavirus. There are gonna be people out there who say, I've never gotten the flu shot, I'm never gonna get it. I got the flu shot, the one time I got the flu shot is when I got sick. I understand all your beliefs. But what you're looking at is the ability to tell, you know, if you say I've had my flu shot, then you're much less likely to have the flu, so we are known to worry more about COVID. The other thing is, is that if you don't get the flu, you're much less likely to get the flu plus COVID, which there are some studies from the Southern Hemisphere where uh, influenza already is, showing that there's a much higher mortality if you have a co-infection between influenza and COVID. Now, the benefit to that is there's also some really good studies showing that there is much less flu being seen transmitting because people are wearing masks and doing social distancing. So the same things that work for COVID work for flu, which adds to the benefit that flu is, COVID is being transmitted like the flu by respiratory droplets instead of air. And so we're seeing a smaller flu season in some of these areas. Now it's early, so we don't know, it could be much worse. But what's important is, is that the last thing we want to do is have a COVID pandemic and an influenza pandemic at the same time. So it's really, really important. I'm going to ask you to help me, help you, help your community, wear your masks, do your distancing, wash your hands. It's not about protecting yourself. You're right. You may get, you may not have any problem with the flu. You may do really well. You may be young and healthy and unlikely to have a bad outcome but you might be a transmitter for this virus, have a very low level of illness, feel well enough to go to work and transmit it to several other people who may not do well. This is the civic side of infectious disease and public health. It's not just about protecting yourself. You don't get a vaccine just to protect yourself. You get it to protect yourself and everyone around you. It's to protect grandma who has lupus or the baby who has lung problems. It's being civic minded. And you know, I'm not asking you to get it for you, I'm asking you to get it for everybody. So think about it and really determine whether or not you wanna run the risk of both COVID and flu for yourself and for your family because you can prevent the flu with the vaccine. So this is the United States Flu Watch activity. You can see it's 2019, 2020 influenza season. We're coming right to the end of it, but you can see that there's some Sorry, Iowa, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but they have some high influenza-like illness. The rest of the country is moderate with the, you know, Puerto Rico being an exception. But really, we haven't seen a lot of flu yet. We're not there yet. So now's the time to act. West Virginia University is going to start offering influenza vaccine next week, September 28th. And you can get it. Some people have already gotten it. 
most years I say wait till the beginning of October. I'm going to say that anyway to protect yourself during flu season because we don't see a lot of it. But make sure you get it. Next week is the perfect time to start getting it. Get, build up that immunity. So <laughs> with luck and management, if there's a COVID vaccine in late November, early December, you're already protected against flu and you're ready to go rock and roll for your COVID vaccine. So really, you know, wh why do we do this? Why do we talk about the adoption of these kind of reducing transmission? And this is what I was talking about before. This is the flu uh, influenza activity is currently low in the United States and globally. And it's the, the we think it's due to the widespread community mitigation methods for COVID-19. We're seeing that it's actually decreased the positivity of influenza rate from 20% to about 2.3 in these low areas. Um, so low, remained at historically low interseasonal areas in the Southern Hemisphere, which recommends, which kind of tells us that these things work to reduce influenza. And why that is important is because you definitely want to decrease the incidence of severity of illness for the influenza season for the Northern Hemisphere with reduction in transmission and, and in essence, reduce the risk of mortality associated with COVID plus influenza. Remember, flu kills, still kills people. So, you know, we don't want to be super worried about COVID and not pay attention to flu, which is one of our historical big enemies. So basically, I've talked a lot about all these numbers and all these things and use my big doctor words to impress you that I know what I'm talking about. But it all kind of boils down to this. You need to wear a mask anytime you're in public or if you're with people that you no aren't normally around. So if the cable guy comes to your house to work on your cable box, wear a mask and insist that he wears one. If your relatives are coming from out of town and they're stopping by for the evening, wear a mask. Avoid large gatherings. I know that sucks. It does. You want to see your family, your friends. It's been a long time, but we're still not there. Okay. You know, it's going to be really hard going into the holiday season with Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you really have to use your best judgment and avoid large gatherings, especially when people are coming from all over the country, all over the state to be together. Get your flu shot starting next week. I'm a big proponent of getting the shot at the right time. Wash your hands often. Washing your hands even more than immunization is the single largest preventative of infectious disease. And it's, it's something you learned in kindergarten. Don't forget about it. Sanitize your hands when you can't wash them. If you're feeling unwell, stay home and call your PCP. If you get COVID tested, stay home until you get the results. Don't go get your COVID test and then drive over to Martin's to get groceries. If you are worried enough that you might be sick, be worried enough to wait for the results. And if you have COVID, stay home. Don't go out. It's about protecting the community, not just yourself. You may feel well enough to go out. You may say, I have a little bit of a sore throat and a little bit of cough. This is nothing. I can go, but I, ha I know I have COVID. Stay home. Protect yourself and the people around you. All right. This is where we get to the kind of the big wrap up. And here's the lesson. You've done great. I've asked you to do a lot of difficult things over the last six months, and you've done a wonderful job showing that West Virginia spirit, that Mountaineer spirit, uh, we're all in this together, and I'm really proud of you. But this is the bottom of the seventh. You know, this is the big stretch before we go into the final innings, and we definitely need to not lay off the pressure now. Continue going. We're, there is a vaccine in sight. There will be a vaccine definitely by this time next year and probably much sooner. It may even be a reality by Thanksgiving or Christmas. Don't give up the fight now. Continue to push. Stay together apart. Okay? Until next time, take care of yourself and each other. And remember, we're here for you.